Isn't that a beautiful song? Sweet, sweet spirit. It kind of brings you into the mood where you know everything's going to be okay, right? <laughs> um, I love that song, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Um, the topic today is the comforter, the comforter. And we live in a world where we need a comforter. We need a helper in this world. As I was pondering on all of the craziness and all the, the ills of this world, it got me depressed. That's when I looked at my own life as well and the things that have happened in my life, and I'll share some things with you as well as I go through this sermon. We're, we live in a world where there's a lot of hurt. <clears throat> there's a lot of pain in this world. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road to live in this world. A lot of people have have lost family members. They, um, people have got into accidents. People are suffering terribly in this world. And uh, you know, some, you know, in the seclusion of living in Melbourne, maybe in, in, in our lives. We can sometimes become immune to all the good things that are happening in the world. And, um, and, uh, and I think unless we really feel it, we really feel the need for a comforter, we're not going to have the comforter with us. We're going to really, we really need to examine our lives and see the world around us as it really is and how Jesus describes the world. Because there is so much pain in this world, a lot of confusion, so much misdirection, false, fake news, you know, you've heard of that phrase before. So many different things that are vying for our attention. You know, you have social media, and you see all the videos of the things happening in the Middle East and the, and the rumors of war between North Korea and America and, and, uh, and all the other things that are going on. There's people dying each and every day. There's injustice that's happening. You know, the things that happened in Indonesia this week. Things like that. There's so many things that are going on in this world. In our, in our personal lives, I, I, I've talked with you. I've seen what you're going through. You guys are struggling with your work. You're struggling to pass exams. You're struggling to make ends meet. You're, you're worried about your visa. You're worried about this. You're worried about that. We need a comforter. And if, if you don't feel it, if you don't feel the need of a comforter, you will not receive the comforter. Before Jesus left, he, left, he, he gave us a promise that we just read. And let's turn there, John 14. And uh, before we turn, I'm going to pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and great mercy. But we thank you for your word that gives us light to our path. Lord, we thank you so much for leaving us a helper, a comforter in times of need. And Lord, we truly need this helper, this comforter, Lord, in our lives. Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come in our hearts and minds. Lord, there's so much trouble going on in this world, and we need your power. We need your spirit. We need your indwelling Christ to be within our hearts. Lord, may the foolishness of preaching this morning, may it affect the people's hearings, may they be changed forevermore. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to John 14. 25 to 27. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And he, and he says this regarding the Holy Spirit. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. And he leaves you with this promise. You know, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The Holy Spirit is here to, to help you not be troubled, to help you take heart 
and to not let you be afraid. Um, this is a slide of, you, can you guys guess what this is? This is a slide of a bee, like of a bee. And a bee naturally has this thing uh, that he has on his head, it's called pollen. And pollen is pretty much stuck on his head. It's, it's like right next to him all the time. And as he goes to, from flower to flower, he can't naturally but what's called pollinate flowers. But this thing that's on his head naturally sticks to him. Just a, it's just something that, that he has about him when he's uh, flying around. And it's astonishing what we see. Actually, we're gonna turn to John 16. And read verse um, verse seven. Verse seven. And we're gonna see what it says here. Read in verse seven. It says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but I will depart, and I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they, they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, therefore I said that he will make, he will take of mine and declare it to you. When we accept Jesus in our lives, when we accept the crucifixion that he offers. We talked about this last night in terms of surrender. We're surrendering our lives to God, but in return, we get the impartation of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is something that is not just stuck on you like the pollen is on your head, although he is right beside you, but the promise is that the Holy Spirit is going to be within you, within you. And that's a totally different story. And we're celebrating Mother's Day right now. And uh, there's one thing of having your kid right next to you, right? You know, there's a, it's, that's one thing having your kid, like, you know, sit right next to you. But there's, that's a, it's a whole different story. I mean, I'm not a woman, so I wouldn't understand this totally. But it's a totally different story when a kid is inside of you, right? When a kid is actually living within. What is the difference? What is the difference of having it inside of you? rather than just right next to you. What is the difference? The difference is that the thing right next to you, right next to you can sometimes, you know, maybe leave, right? Go to another room or, you know, leave to another part of the house or, or whatnot. But if it's in within you, wherever you go, whether you go to the supermarket or if you go to the school, if you go to work, the Holy Spirit, that the person is within you. And that's a guarantee for us in our Christian walk, amen? It's a guarantee that we have somebody with us no matter where we go. So if you're stuck in the jungles of uh, the Philippines or if you're, you're all the way in the Amazon, you're always going to have the Holy Spirit as a believer in Christ, amen? John 14 and 20 says, On that day you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me. And you are in me, and I am in you. This is a very pivotal, pivotal verse. If I had uh, an envelope, I wanted to give an illustration. But this
this is saying is that when we accept Jesus, Jesus comes into our heart, right? But it says that Jesus is from the Father. Oh, that's okay. Jesus is from the Father. And so now, because Jesus is in the Father and, and, and Jesus lives in me, we have like a, almost like a three-layer protection system. A three-layer protection system that Satan and the world can't get uh, to you uh, without going through those three um, people, three agencies. The first is the Father. And obviously Satan can't get through the Father because the Father is the Almighty Father and Creator of the universe. He's, you know, he's, um, he's, he's supreme. So he can't go through that. But even if he did, even if we, he did, he has to go through Jesus to get to us. But even if he got through Jesus to get to us, Jesus is living within us. So we have a three-layer protection system. How many of us want to have a three-layer protection system at our house? But wouldn't you want that? You know, a lot of us, we invest in, um, I don't know what they call it here in Australia, in America, where we have uh, uh, things like, called like defense alarms that you have when somebody tries to break in, you know, and, um, you know, if somebody opens the door without your permission or something, and it'll go off, it's called guardian alarm, you know, it's like, and then um, when, they, when they enter, you know, the alarm's go off, and it, it calls the, it calls a agency to call the police. So um, if anybody tries to intrude, you know you're safe because you're gonna have somebody come to the house directly. But here, we have something of, of even more comfort than just a guardian alarm system. We have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit all within, all within us. Isn't that amazing, amen? We have an amazing, amazing system, a three-tier system. And in this world that we live in, where so many things are vying for our attention, isn't it amazing, and isn't it wonderful that we have a comforter to go through this maze that we're living in? John 16, 33 says it like this. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me, in me, you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, all the things that I mentioned, sickness and sadness and death and divorce, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. This world full of disease and pain is being overcome by Jesus himself. And he's promising to have a place in your heart to live through the Holy Spirit, amen? This is a beautiful promise. This is a beautiful problem, promise. As we go through our day, from day to day, we, we need to have this assurance that it says here in John 16, 33, that if our lives are in Jesus Christ, we are overcomers, amen? We are overcomers in this world. This world that's full of people that are ruthless, rulers, people that are full of trickery and, de and deception, all these things that are happening in this world, he has overcome. And because he lives within us, we are overcomers as well. Some of us are going through certain addictions. We have an uh, addiction towards discouragement. We have addiction towards uh, lust. We have addictions towards money and pride. A lot of us are trying to be overcomers over, the, over these things. And we can't do it within, in, and of our, in and of ourselves. We need an overcomer, someone who can actually do it. And that's the promise that is being given here. That the overcomer, the Holy Spirit can come and be a helper with you to overcome all the different things that we struggle in this life. Amen? It's a beautiful, beautiful promise. Again, John 16, 5 through 8, which, I just, which we just read, calls in the comforter. And how is he going to be a comforter to us? It talks about three things that he's going to be doing to help us be comforted. Three things. He says he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Three things that he's going to do. How is that of comfort? How is that of comfort if the, the Holy Spirit is going to remind us of our sin? Is that comforting? Like, oh man, you know, if I, if I came up to you and I, and I just followed you all day and I, I was sharing you, you know, all your faults and whatnot, telling you, you know, you should have you done this, you know, at this moment in time. You should have, you, you know, you should have watched this and you should have do that. How is that, how is that of comfort? How is that of comfort? And of righteousness and of judgment. Of righteousness and judgment. We're going to go through how that is of comfort to us. How that is of comfort to us. Before I get there, I want to uh, share a story in my life. Um, there was a time in my life in uh, 2007 where uh, I was in medical school in the Caribbean. I was going through to a Caribbean medical school just south of Florida. And at that time, I was engaged as well. I was, uh, you know, on the on the track to become, you know, American doctor, like what my my dad really wanted me to do. And um, as I was, you know, going through uh, this long distance relationship, and I was uh, going through my my schooling and whatnot, things started to, to there's things started to get in trouble. Uh, our, my relationship uh, broke down. My uh, academics were suffering. Uh, my finances was going down the hole, and I really was in a state of depression. I ended up uh, leaving uh, because of various reasons. My, my dad eventually uh, abandoned the family and uh, did his own thing. He went to uh, Indonesia and uh, started some uh, entrepreneur work and whatnot. And he really basically didn't come back. And he was my main like financier and, and helper. Uh, during that time. So, my relationship failed. My schooling was failing. My own parents were not there for me anymore. I, I felt like the world was just tumbling down. All the things that I planned in my life, I felt like, oh man, I have no hope anymore. You know, well, what's, the, what's, the, what's the reason to keep going on if I don't have anything? To, uh, to aspire for or any kind of uh, relationship. My image was lost. I felt like my family image was lost. The reputation of, of, uh, of our family was lost. But there was one thing that came to my mind was this, uh, these verses. That no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens to our image, our reputation, whatever happens to our family, Whatever happens to our relationship with uh, our spouse or our girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever, no matter how bad it can get in this in this life, and some some of us have gone through worse. We've gone through certain diseases and whatnot. No matter what goes on in this life, I always knew that there's a comforter. That there's a comforter, amen. And if I didn't have that in mind. I could have easily gone into a, you know, a suicidal ideation or just, you know, certain paths that I shouldn't have gone. I could have gone into drugs. I could have gone into uh, other addictions and whatnot. But because of the comfort, because of the Holy Spirit and prayer, as we talked about in the past series on prayer, because of prayer and because I knew the Holy Spirit was living within me and I knew that no matter what was going to happen in my life, I knew that the Holy Spirit was going to guide me and to, and to reprove me of sin and righteousness and tell me of the judgment to come. And we're going to talk about how the judgment to come is a promise, a promise that this world is going to finish. This world of hate and greed and selfishness is going to end one day. There is going to be a judgment. There's going to be ultimate judgment that happens in this world. And I knew that all the false facades in this world, all the veneers and all the different pretending that's going on in this world is gonna be revealed for what it really is. And then when that day happens, I'm gonna be with the Lord. And I, 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 that was just a promise that I knew as the Comforter was reminding me of all these things. He was reproving me of sin and righteousness and of judgment to come. Jeremy gave a Bible 
Bible study on these uh, on the role of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, what is its function, what are the symbols. If you were here last week, and I took pictures here, I took pictures of your uh, of your slides because it was a really good study. I mean, it was very comprehensive. We talked about the role of it, what, who, the, who the Holy Spirit is, and it's very scary nowadays. If we don't study our Bibles, and I'm glad that there's, some, there's certain people here that are really delving into deep Bible study and learning the different, uh, the logic of, of how we get to certain uh, theology and certain uh, doctrines. We need to be very, very careful because if we don't have a good understanding of the Holy Spirit, people are going to come to you and say, you know, certain things, certain heresies, and you're going to be swept away by these things. There's movements that are out there. Have you heard of like anti-Trinitarianism and all these other things that are coming into this into our into our churches? We need to really understand this, but I'm glad that Jeremy gave a study on this because it clears everything up. It clears everything up. The Holy Spirit in nature is God Himself. He's omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, holy, eternal. He's the, called the Lord. He's the truth, the way, the life. He creates the Holy Spirit. As God Himself lives within you. What are the symbols or the functions of the Holy Spirit? He went through the different things that um, are describing the Holy Spirit. For example, the dove and the fire, the oil and the water. All these things are, are things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And these are beautiful, beautiful things that He talked about. He gives peace. He helps with the sanctification process. Once we accept Jesus in our hearts, He's not going to leave us there. He's going to do what I was just talking about: reprove you of sin. And this is this is the this is the whole process of sanctification. As you once you accept Jesus, He's not going to leave you there. You can just go on and do do whatever you want. He's going to keep reminding you of things that you can overcome. He's going to show you your sins in your life, and that's what the sanctification process is. The Holy Spirit shows you where you need to improve. And innocence convicts of righteousness. In God's presence is the power of life through the symbol of fire. He consecrates us and sets us apart and helps us understand the Word of God. How many of us want to be deeper, you know, Bible students? We want to understand the deeper truths of the Bible. A lot of us are still confused about certain things. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit. Works such that we cannot see Him, though we see His workings. And, and this is just something that is the nature of God. And this is something I really wanted to address uh, right now. There's, there's many things in this life that we cannot see, but we know absolutely certain that they're, that they're there. For example, if you're, if you're a scientist, the laws of gravity, those are absolutely there. The laws of thermodynamics, right? Electromagnetism, you know, the, the weak and strong nuclear force. These are all things that we cannot see, but we know absolutely that they're there. In the same way, it says that God is the Spirit. He works in such that we cannot see Him, though we see His workings, and we see that all around us. If we don't have that settled in our mind, and just because we can't see it, it's see, you know, see the Holy Spirit, then is He really there? You know, a lot of us still have doubts in that regard. But the fact that we, we trust so many different things in regards to the things that we can't see, and the, and the Holy Spirit is something that we can't see, but we can see is working. He cleanses us and satisfies our needs in the, in the symbol of water. In the symbol of water. And he talked about how we get the Holy Spirit. For those who believe and ask, repent and be baptized, obey. And I'm just so, so thankful. Amen for somebody that's going to be giving their life to baptism today. Amen? Amen. This is amazing. This is something that's going to happen. And she's going to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit is going to come upon her. And she's going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit by the repentance and by baptism. And if you haven't been baptized, if you're still thinking about it, and you want the Holy Spirit, this is something that you should consider. Consider getting into Bible studies and looking into how to be baptized. Look into how to be baptized. John 16. 7 through 11 um, talks about this. I, I'm not putting this up just to remind you what the Holy Spirit does. He reproves the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And I'm going to go through these things, go, go through these three things a little, a little by little in the form of art. In the form of art. And I think as um, right
white brain culture that we live in. A lot of us are into economics, a lot of us are students studying like banking and finance and the sciences and whatnot. But th there's, a, there's a thing called art out there. There's a thing called art, and a lot of us, you know, sometimes don't appreciate the arts as much. Because, you know, some, sometimes we don't get into those fields where, um, you know, we focus more on just our creativity and whatnot. But the, 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 the comforter comes with an art form. There's an art to how he works and, and how he paints the brush of our lives. And I'm going to talk about these, these three things in this way. The art of disruption, the art of elimination, and the art of, sol of sol uh, solidarity. The art of so solidarity. The art of the disruption. How does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Yes, He reminds us of these things, but how does that happen in a very pragmatic way? And I want us to think about very determining factors that have changed the course of your life. Like for mine, one was, you know, when I uh, left medical school. What are the key moments in your life that has changed the directory or path of your life? Think about this. What are the times in your life that, that the key moments in your life that has changed the directory and the direction of your, your life? Many times, many times, it is not the joyful, you know, occasion that has changed the course of your life. It is in the pain and the disruptions that caused this change. It is in the pain and the disruptions that cause us to change. So one day, maybe, you know, your husband or your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse comes up to you and says, you know what? I just don't love you anymore. I can't, you know, I can't keep going on like this anymore. And, he, and there, there's a disruption in the relationship. Maybe, you know, your um, your secretary says that, uh, you know, the, the money on the books is not accurate. We're actually in the hole by 50%. I think we're going to have to declare bankruptcy. You know, all of a sudden, things start changing. You go to the hospital where you thought maybe it was just a simple procedure, and all of a sudden you're, the doctor says, we see a growth in the lymph nodes of your, of, your, of your neck. You know, all of a sudden there's a disruption in your life. Or maybe, you know, you, you thought you did well on your, on your exam. The exam comes back and you, and you failed. And you're like, I'm going to have to do this all over again. You know, like all over you, I have to spend the money and all this thing. Maybe you get in an accident. Maybe somebody hits you in, in, the, in the rear end of your car. And it causes you to have pain for the rest of your life. You know, there's, these, are, these are actual situations that happen in our lives. There's disruptions that happen in your life. And there's, it's interesting that in these times of distress, in these times that I've just mentioned, through this pain, the Holy Spirit is reminding you of those things that I mentioned to you, of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. Because we're going to have to deal with this. In those situations, there's a moment of clarity in that empty space of your life. There's moments of clarity that come into your life that say, yes, you know what? <sighs> there has to be more to life. You know, there has to be more than just, you know, going through this rigmarole that all these expectations and external factors are telling me that I need to do. You know, there, there's so many things in this life that are more important than these things, you know? You know, if you go to the hospital, we have doctors here and um, nurses, and you talk to people on their deathbed, you talk to them on their deathbed, you know, you know you're not going to hear people talk about Oh uh, man, I wish I had that new refrigerator, you know. Or I, I wish I, I wish I had that uh, that expensive car, you know. What, what do most people say they, they want to to do? They want to be with their family. They want to spend time with their grandkids. They want to uh, have quality time, you know, with their family and their friends. You know, they want to call up, you know, somebody that's you know long distance 
far away. They want to talk to, they, they want to talk to people. You know, these moments that happen in your life bring up parts of your life where, you know what? It's not really that important. You know, all these things. We live in a very temporary life. Maybe 80, 70 years max. You know, these moments of clarity, you start realizing, you know what? Life isn't that long. Life is short. And you start realizing, am I right with God? Am I right with God? Are there anything in my life that's inhibiting my walk and my relationship with God? Many times, it is in the pain and in the disruptions of life that we realize the Holy Spirit coming in our lives and telling us where to go and how to live. There's a, a, a guy named Frederick Buchner who uh, studied uh, Van Gogh paintings, again, about art. And he said, as he was writing his book about Van Gogh and about his own life, he said, I hadn't learned yet the importance of letting the empty place inside of me open up. Letting the empty place inside of me open up. And he's talking about in regards to writing a book because he had writer's block. Have you heard of writer's block? Any, anybody do essays and you, you, know, you just can't keep writing, you don't know what to write? But he was writing a book and he wanted to write a book uh, about Van Gogh and about artists and whatnot. And he just didn't know how to move forward. But until he got to the point where he recognized the importance of letting an empty, empty place inside of him open up. And basically what that, what is, what that means is that we, a lot of us, we have guards in our life. Many of us have these big walls that we have placed in our lives that we, we can't let people in. We're not letting people in to our lives because we've been hurt, maybe. That's one thing. Maybe we've been slighted in some way. Maybe we've, we've been on the receiving end of a bias, a bigotry, or something like that. Many of us have this empty place inside that we're not letting the Holy Spirit come into. We're not being vulnerable. We're not being genuine and authentic with God. And until that happens, until that happens in your life, until you're vulnerable and you actually let others in, especially if you can't let others, others in, how are you going to let the Holy Spirit in? But we're not letting this empty space in our hearts be filled with, with anything. We're not letting it be filled with the Holy Spirit, mainly. And a lot of us have this empty space, this empty space in our hearts. And, we're, and, and it really hurts me, it saddens me. Because many of you have rightfully so put up walls. Rightfully so you have put up walls in your life because maybe you were sexually abused. Maybe you were, um, you were taken advantage of in, in a certain way, financially or physically or mentally. Something had, has, had, had happened in your life where you rightfully so said, you know what, I'm going to put a wall in my heart and my mind, and I'm not going to let anybody in. I'm not going to let anything hurt me and give me pain like, like that incident did in the past. So you just put this wall up in your life, and you can't let people in. You don't let people talk to you in a genuine way. You can't just talk about your struggles in life. You know, like a lot of time we go through our, our week-to-week thing, and we're like, you know, how you doing? Man, the weather was great this week, yeah? Yeah, man, that's, oh, man, it was nice and sunny. I can't believe the, you know, the transition in weather. And then they're like, well, have, have a happy Sabbath. See you next week. You know? And, and then and you do it another week, and then, you know, and the same thing happens. But then it, there's a disruption again that happens when someone says, you know, you know what, I'm not really having a good week. And you're like, all of a sudden, like that, the routine, like, stops, right? You're, you're like, oh, you're not having a good week? Oh, hey, what's going on? And then they, they share something, you know, deep and heavy, and you don't know how to respond anymore because you're not used to it. You're not used to people like sharing their, their feelings and sharing their thoughts because you're just used to like talking about the weather and talking about sports and talking about anything else but something that's really deep inside. The loneliness that you feel, maybe. The uh, depression that you feel. The emotions that you feel of being inadequate and um, and um, not having the ability to do certain things. So this
this empty space. The Holy Spirit is coming into your life. And we need to surrender. We need to open up. We need to open up to the Holy Spirit to, to have Him do an inventory of your life and to see where He can work in your life. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because in, this, in the disruptions of life, this art of disruption that the Holy Spirit can come into, this pain has a way of making us honest and seeing things more clearly. The facade, the image, the presentation that we, that we have with others, this illusion that everything is okay goes away in this moment of pain, in this moment of disruption that happens in life. This is an interesting uh, story. Uh, this Polish man in 1941, his father and mother and sister died. And on the same day, and this is recorded by uh, Peggy Noonan, he comes back from his factory of working and whatnot, and he, and he finds out that his father and his mother and his sister has died. And, and Peggy Noonan, a famous American writer, writes, ripped out of the soil of his background, his life could no longer be what it used to be. He now began a journey to deeper communion with God, but it didn't come without tears, and it didn't come without what seems to have been certain existential horror. Now, who's that person? Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II. In his religious uh, path, in his religious struggle, it took this really heinous crime, this heinous event that happened in his life, to really realize the things that are most important in life. And so he went on this spirit, spiritual journey. But he said this, she says that his life could no longer be what it used to be. And this is important because a lot of us are going through life just following the, the traditions of man. You know, we're just going, following the train of, uh, of, of uh, commercialism and uh, capitalism. We're just going through the, the train that, that that's, the society tells us that we should live. But when something happens and disrupts in your life, your life can no longer be what it used to be. That's happened in my life, and I've heard a lot of your testimonies. It's happened in your life as well. And the Holy Spirit is there to come in, to remind you, to comfort you, to tell you that things are going to be okay. The Holy Spirit is going to be there as your helper. And then there's the art of elimination. The art of elim elimination. Great artists understand that it isn't just how much you can cram into art. It is an equally important task in how much you can take away. The science of simplicity. And this is a, a very, very important principle. Van Gogh, Johnny Cash, Steve Jobs, they all understood this art. When you're making art, it's not just a matter of what you put into it. But many times it's about what you can eliminate. What are the things in your life that you can eliminate to make, 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 uh, make you see the picture you want to have, and the picture that you want to relate to others? Michelangelo said it best when he made the statue of the David. Have you guys heard of the, the statue of the David? Very famous uh, uh, sculpture. But he said he looked at a block of clay, or, or what is it? Um, no, yeah, yeah. But it's marble, marble, yeah. He looked at a, a, a block of marble and he said, I can see David within it. People start with this big block of marble and they're able to chip away and take away all the stuff that is there to get to that picture that they want to see. And God has a picture for you in your life, He has a vision. He has what he wants to see in your life. But there's so many things that are clouding your life. There's so many distractions in your life. And God is coming into your life to eliminate a lot of these things. To show you what's most important. So he can see his image. So he can see the image he has in you. There's a, there's a process and art of elimination. And all these people have gone. And if I went through each story, it would amaze you how much these lives 
They needed to eliminate many things before they got to their invention or they got to, to their potential in regards to their, their career or their art form. Another uh, person talking about Van Gogh says, Bob's Boom's values were precise and exquisite. And Vincent learned that it is always the simplest piece of art which has practiced the most rigid elimination and is therefore the most difficult to reproduce. It's always the simplest piece of art which has practiced the most rigid elimination. Some of the most beautiful art out in the world is not just, you know, you just throw stuff together, but it's exquisite because they take all the excess stuff out and you can see it for what it really is. And I, I want us to think about this. Have you meditated about your life and what's most important? Do you stop during the week? Do you stop during the day? Do you stop, you know, you go throughout the Sabbath and just kind of think about what's the most important things in your life? What are the most important things in your life? And I talked about this. When we go to the hospital and when people on their deathbed, we tend to bring to mind what truly matters. And uh, finally, I want to close with this. I want to do an exercise about the comforter. And uh, this is an exercise on what it means to comfort. You know, sometimes you know, I can talk about the comforter you know, being inside of you and how he comforts. But sometimes the way God illustrates, he, got, he illustrates using, you know, human examples or he uses nature and whatnot. And I want to go through this exercise. How many of us, how many of us have gone personally or know somebody personally that gone through cancer? That has gone through cancer? Yes? All right. And um, I want you to stand up, actually. I want you to say that if you know somebody or if you've gone through somebody or if you know somebody or if you've gone uh, through cancer yourself, please stand up. Please stand up. Uh, we won't do this part yet. Uh, and if you uh, and remain standing, if you know someone who died from cancer, if you don't, you can, you can sit down. If you, if you know somebody who died from cancer. And this is the third one. Stand up if you have cried over someone who died from cancer. You probably cried. And now I want us to go to somebody. Maybe somebody you know or somebody you don't know. That's okay. And go over there to them and you know give them a hug. Tell them I understand. I just, uh, I just if you could do that for me, that would be just great. Just find somebody and go over to them and tell them I understand. I understand what you're going through. You can do that right now.
help other people as well that are going through similar situations. And it's a beautiful thing when you have a church and you have a church family and you have people and friends that can be there for you and comfort you during those times. They can tell you, I am here for you. I understand. I am sorry that you're going through this. But I'm going to be there as your friend, as your confidant, as somebody that's going to be there for you. And I want to challenge us today, and this is my appeal, that as we go through our Christian experience, to really ponder these things in our hearts, the pain that we go through, the, uh, the, the disruptions that happen in our life, and how the Holy Spirit can come in and reveal these things to you, and He can come in and comfort you. Because if you don't feel it, if you don't feel the need for the Holy Spirit, you're not going to ask for the Holy Spirit. You know, you're not going to ask for the Holy Spirit if you don't really recognize the need for the Holy Spirit. And many times we do, you know, we say things very glibly, or glibly when you pray, you know, you pray for the Holy Spirit, you know, please, you know, come down and send the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and whatnot. But I want us to really have, like, up behind our prayer when we say that. You know, I want us to have really, like, strong meaning behind when you ask for the Holy Spirit. When you ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to comfort you, to be a helper in times of need. When Jesus left, he left us with the Holy Spirit, a friend. A friend that's not just going to be right next to you, but he's going to be living inside of you. And he's going to direct you, and he's going to lead you to the kingdom, where the Father and the Son are going to be. This Holy Spirit is God himself going to be living, living within you, the hope of glory. How many of us this morning want the Holy Spirit? How many of us want to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal in our lives sin and righteousness and the judgment to come? It's your desire to stand as